that was Jesse Ware singing Wildest Moments, and you are listening to The Wild Side on Source 96.1 FM, and I am your host, Caitlin Kite, and today we are going to be talking not about wild moments, but about ecosystems and restoration ecology. And you might be wondering what on earth the song Wildest Moments has to do with that particular topic, since you probably know that I like to match my music to my topic. Well, the whole theme of this week was inspired by um, a place that I know from my hometown, from my, well not my hometown, but near where I grew up, and it's a place that I visited several times with my family. It's a, it's a really interesting and kind of unique area, and it's called the Wilds, and it's, a, it's an area that's about 10,000 acres of reclaimed mine land, and it's in a rural area of my state, which is Ohio. And it's a facility that's used not just to help native wildlife, but also to help threaten wildlife from elsewhere. Not just elsewhere in the country, but actually elsewhere in the world. So it hosts a total of 31 rare and endangered species from around the globe, and 13 of these are recognized as being officially endangered. And some of the examples of these things include the southern white rhino, which is very difficult to breed in captivity but four were produced at the wilds last year alone, and, and three of these represent fourth-generation rhinos. And as far as I know, the wilds is actually the only place right now that's been able to produce fourth-generation captive rhinos. And this is quite exciting because these are the sorts of things that are useful not just for um, shipping off rhinos to repopulate zoos and try to get breeding pairs elsewhere, but also to maybe grow up enough of these animals in captivity that we can then release them in the wild to replenish natural stocks. And some other species include the scimitar horned oryx, um, which is an example of a reintroduction that was successful. So this guy was returned to Tunisia as part of a restoration uh, project there in the wild. And also thing like, things like banteng and Persian onagers. Now at the wilds, there are also a lot of efforts aimed at educating visitors and conducting scientific research and just kind of doing wild, natural kind of science topics in general. So for instance, they study freshwater mussels, which are quickly declining throughout the U.S. They also investigate techniques such as artificial insemination for improving captive breeding efforts, and they've been instrumental in developing cheetah sustainability plans in order to help cheetahs in the wild. And all of this is happening in a site where none of these animals are um, obviously from. Originally, we don't have cheetahs in Ohio, as fun as that would be. Um, and it actually, not only are those things brought there in this really interesting institute, but they also are brought to a place that was mined extensively for 40 years. So between the 1940s and the 1980s, the wilds was a site of extensive surface mining, and it was basically just a pit by the time the, the mining industry was done. And it, everything had been taken out, the trees, the grasses, the topsoil, all the minerals in several layers of soil. So there really wasn't much left. And we have this rule in the U.S. that was passed in um, the 1970s where people, it's called the Federal Reclamation Act, and people are obliged to go in and at the very minimum they have to contour the land and make it uh, so it's got a natural looking contour, add in some topsoil, and introduce plants in order to try to control erosion. And there are many such sites like this throughout the U.S., but the problem is that they're often not very productive. So people in industry tend to do the bare minimum and that means that ecosystems don't, often don't look or act the way that they used to. And so the wilds is, is quite a success story because it's a place that not only has been reclaimed that does function quite well, but it functions quite well not just for native things but for non-natives that have been brought in in this scientific uh, conservation setting. Now, the reason that I wanted to talk about the wilds today was to kind of introduce this whole idea of restoration ecology. And the restoration ecology is the thing that allowed the wilds uh, to be restored into something so that it was improved on the standard way of going in and reclaiming these old mining sites. So what is restoration ecology? Well, it's a field that's devoted to initiating or speeding up the recovery of a system that's been degraded in some way by some sort of disturbance. And often these disturbances are from humans, so obviously mining is an anthropogenic disturbance. But there are also cases where we've got natural disasters, things like tornadoes and hurricanes, that go in and they wipe out huge areas of the land. And often, um, you know, just for the sake of humans, we want it to look nice again, but also we might have some protected species there, or we might have species 
that are doing quite important things for the environment and that, and that impacts us in some way because of the services that they provide, ecologically speaking. And so we want to go in and try to get these areas looking like they used to look and functioning the way that they used to function. And so restoration ecology operates on two basic assumptions. The first is that the bulk of environmental damage is at least partly reversible, and so we can figure out methods in order to get these sites looking and acting the way that they used to. And also the second thing is that ecosystems can only tolerate so much disturbance before they're changed irreparably. And so we recognize that at some point you have to step in and stop the effects of these disturbances, whether they're humans or not, and try to get, uh, try to put things back to normal in some way. So the way they do this is uh, these ecologists will go in and examine the ecosystem in order to identify and manipulate the processes that are limiting recovery. And so this might be things like there aren't enough nutrients, or maybe there's a key species that's missing, or maybe it's multiple things all at once. And so they try to figure out what it is that needs to be changed in some way and then act accordingly in order to help, um, help that happen, help the process move along. And there are lots of different management activities that can play a role in restoration ecology. But to understand these, I think it's first important to have a bit of a lesson on ecosystems and how they function. And so I'm going to do a little bit of kind of basic science here and then swing it back around to the restoration ecology. So hopefully you'll see how this kind of under underlying biological um, and chemical and geological process, uh, what's happening in the different ecosystems, how all these things underlie the ecological efforts that help get these habitats like the wilds and other places back into the kind of shape that we want them to be in. So let's start really basically and just explore the idea of ecosystems. What are ecosystems? Well, they're the sum of all organisms that live in a given area, and also ecosystem includes the non-living or abiotic factors with which these things interact. And so these abiotic things are things like air and soil and water. Now ecosystems, we use this word all the time, and so you kind of you get used to throwing it out there without really thinking about what it actually means. And the truth is it can be very hard to define an ecosystem because uh, we, we do know basically you know, all things kind of have an effect on all other things eventually, even though it might be very indirect and many steps removed, there are going to be these things that link us all. So how do you define the edges of, a, um, of an ecosystem, the boundaries? It can be quite hard to do, and in many cases we just roughly estimate the borders because we need to have that concept in order to help us um, you know, make rules or perform studies. And so it's not 100% accurate all the time, but it does um, help us kind of visualize the natural world uh, as well as we can in a given setting. Now, ecosystems can be quite large or quite small as well, and it really depends on, on how broad your viewpoint is. So for example, uh, one ecosystem might be you know, the entire Lake Victoria in Africa, or it could just be a single person's stomach where you've got all of your gut flora. So we're talking about um, places that have maybe all one type of organism, so just a bunch of little bacteria living together in one place, or much larger areas that have uh, fungi and animals and plants and all sorts of things inhabiting the area together. And it can be quite complex, but it can also be quite simple, and it totally depends on which ecosystem we're talking about. And all ecosystems, no matter how big or small, are going to include two fundamental phenomena, and these include energy flow and chemical cycling. And these are kind of the most fundamental things that we can think of in nature that impact how animals are, uh, sorry, not just animals, how organisms are going to interact with each other. So energy flow usually means a process where you've got sunlight coming down through the atmosphere, and then you've got organisms called, um, your primary organisms are your autotrophs that are taking that sunlight and turning it into energy. And then these guys are giving that energy to heterotrophs, which are the things um, like us that are consuming in some way. So they're not primary producers, but they're consumers that come in and either eat the producers themselves or they're secondary consumers that are going to come in and eat consumers. So what I mean by this really is you've got things like bacteria and algae and plants that are um, using the sunlight and then you've got things like herbivores that come in and eat grasses or they eat plants of some sort. And then you've got carnivores that come in to eat the herbivores. And you actually do also have some carnivores, carnivores that will eat other carnivores. And the upshot of this is that you've got um, energy being produced at, 
or energy being moved along through each of these stages, and then energy that's not directly used or ingested is given off as heat. And I should also note that although most of these reactions do start off with sunlight, you do have some organisms that can start this whole process using chemicals. And these are organisms that are going to be found deep uh, under the soil, in uh, caves and in, you know, in volcanoes, and also deep under the ocean in ocean vent areas. And in these places, obviously, there is no sunlight, but they're able to use chemicals that come up um, from all of the, the soil and the rocks around them. Now, chemical cycling is something that's quite important as well, and it involves the movement of elements, such as nitrogen and carbon and phosphorus, between biotic and abiotic forms. So in biotic forms, you, you've got these things that are tied up in such a way that they can't be used by animals in order to drive the processes that happen within our bodies. And, and also, I keep saying animals, but of course I mean all organisms. Um, but also, then you've got these abiotic things that can be transformed into biotic things by the, the primary producers especially, and they, they make these things into a format that all of the other organisms later on can then use. And both energy and chemicals are transformed by the processes of photosynthesis and feeding, but the effects on these two different categories are different. So uh, you've got matter able to be recycled, and therefore it can be turned over within the ecosystem, but then energy we know is finite, so it can only flow through. And so you've got energy flow and chemical cycling both having huge impacts on humans, because these things determine what sorts of things we have available to us and what quality they are and how much we can access it in the ecosystem. And that's why it's quite important for us, if we're thinking about restoration ecology, to think about how these things ultimately impact us. Because if we're doing these conservation efforts, obviously some idea of that uh, is not just because we, we love nature and want to keep nature nice and safe, but also we have to have um, funds that we're distributing to certain projects over others. And those are usually delivered to the projects that are going to be helpful for us in some way. And so one of the ways that we can say which ecosystem needs more help than another is to look at which ones are going to have the sort of energy flow and chemical cycling that are going to help us out the most. Now that was Great Lake Swimmers singing When It Flows. Now, speaking of flowing, the next question I want to answer is how energy flows through a system. Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's something called autotrophs, and these guys are the primary producers. And they support all the other organisms in the ecosystem by making energy accessible to all those other species. And these guys are generally photosynthetic organisms, so things like plants and algae and prokaryotes that use the energy of the sun to synthesize sugars and also other organ organic compounds. And despite the fact that these guys do a lot of hard work and make all these things accessible to us, they actually manage to uh, miss out on a huge portion of the sun's energy. And that's because, uh, not any fault of their own, but basically the sun just, you know, it comes through our atmosphere, but before it even does that, a ton of it is absorbed or scattered or reflected, and so then you only have a small portion of that that makes it through and comes down and strikes materials on the surface of the earth. And a lot of those are non-photosynthetic, and so any time it hits something that's not photosynthetic, then obviously there's not any photosynthesis that's going to take place. And then when it does hit materials, only some portion of, of all the wavelengths in the light can actually be absorbed by photosynthetic pigments. And so ultimately what you have is only approximately 1% of all visible light that comes down to the Earth will actually strike organisms and be used by them. So it's an amazing amount of energy that we could... Um, access in some way, but only a small portion of it is actually being used in order to fuel our ecosystems. Now, as you might imagine, uh, some of the most productive regions are those that are in tropical rainforests and estuaries and coral reefs, where you have quite a lot of sunlight that's hitting um, all day, all year round, and you don't have to worry about seasonality changing how much light um, and nighttime there is. So heterotrophs are all the other organisms in the ecosystem. And these guys depend on primary producers for their energy. And this also includes herbivores that are eating autotrophs directly, carnivores that are eating herbivores, carnivores that are eating other carnivores, and detritivores. And these guys are decomposers, and they eat non-living waste. So 
things like um, when something dies and it's just left maybe on the forest floor, then you've got these guys that come in and, and eat it up. Or you've got wood, or you've got leaf matter that falls off of the tree, or whatever thing you have that maybe was once living but no longer is. So what's, what are the differences between aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems? Well, aquatic e systems are both light and nutrient limited. Now, approximately half of all solar radiation is absorbed in the first 15 meters of water. And that means you've got a whole lot of organisms low down in the water that have to be either very efficient at how they're able to use what sunlight does reach them, or they have to find another source of energy altogether, which is kind of what I was referring to when I mentioned those guys that use the chemicals that come up at those um, deep sea vents. In terms of nutrients, there are, there are lots of nutrients that are considered limiting nutrients, and these are the elements that need to be added for production to increase, and generally speaking, these are nitrogen and phosphorus. And these things can be taken up very quickly by phytoplankton, and so they may constantly be quite low. Um, and when you've got this zone of, of water that's getting a lot of sunlight, then these phytoplankton are going to be very active, and so basically the minute that the phosphorus and the nitrogen appears, they're going to use it, and then it's going to vanish again, and they're going to constantly be wanting more. And that's why we see these blooms, something that's also called eutrophication, in places where you have a lot of input of these uh, sources, these elements. So these are places where you've got runoff, for instance, carrying fertilizer or um, any other kind of chemical matter into the water. So if you ever see these big, um, these big pipelines that dump out a lot of water, that's why you often see algae growing in these areas, because there's a lot of nitrogen in there, there's a lot of phosphorus, and that allows all these organisms to just completely explode because they finally have this nutrient that's been limited. Now I've mentioned a couple times already deep sea vents, and these things often release very high proportions of chemical nutrients from um, below the, the water. So you have all this volcanic activity underneath the surface and it, all this plate tectonic activity and as things shift around and there's a lot of pressure, then the pressure can explode up through the bottom of the seafloor and vent all of these chemicals into the water and that, gets, um, that gives access to these things by all the organisms that are living down there. And you see a lot of these in the Antarctic Ocean, also along the equator, along the coasts of Peru and California and also Western Africa. Now, terrestrial systems also face nutrient limitation, but uh, they're obviously not going to be nearly as limited in terms of sunlight, but they do find limitations because of weather. And that's specifically what I'm referring to is temperature and moisture. So the most productive areas, as you might imagine if you think about places where you know there's a lot of biodiversity, are places that are warm and wet. And that organisms have evolved lots of different ways to deal with a nutrient limitation in order to increase their chances of doing well in harsh environments, so places where it's not warm and wet. It might be cold and dry, or uh, warm and dry, or any combination of things that aren't warm plus wet. So there are things like mycorrhizae, which are fungi that live symbiotically with plants on their roots, and it helps them uptake minerals and water and also other important resources. Similarly, you have plant roots that are making symbiotic relationships with nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and these guys give plants access to forms of organic nitrogen after processing it from its inorganic form so that it can be accessible. And also you just have physical things like plant root morphology. So if plants can branch out and have lots of roots and have little root hairs, they can increase the surface area that contacts with the soil. Or they can release enzymes that break down um, the chemicals in the soil into, into formats that the plants are able to take up. So there are lots of things like this that allow organisms to deal with the conditions that they find themselves in in order to maximize the amount of sunlight that they're able to use and the amount of chemicals and other nutrients that they're able to get out of the environment.